Right. Um, hello, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the 36th meeting of New Directions in Group Theory and Junglet Categories. Today we have Andrew Baker from the University of Glasgow and he will talk to us about locally preparing your subalgebras and their modules. Thank you. Well, um, I, I got an invitation to give a talk in this series about two weeks ago, was it? Two and a half weeks ago. And I, I said yes, but then I thought, well, what am I going to talk about? And then I suddenly remembered that during the first year of the pandemic, I, I sort of got into this non-topology project um, and I thought, well, this is a good thing to give in this seminar. So although there's a lot of topologists in the audience, it's really not meant to be a topology talk. It's, it's meant to be an algebra talk, but my sort of motivation comes from uh, a bit of topology that goes back about half a century. Um, there was a paper by John Moore and Frank Peterson on what they called nearly Frobenius algebras. Um, and about a decade later, Harvey Margolis wrote a very big book on the Steenwood algebra, and he sort of renamed them P-algebras. Um, but basically that's a graded theory. Um, so one of the things, I've been using some ideas from that for a long time, but one of the things that always sort of niggled up with me was why isn't this a, why isn't there a version of this story in the non-graded setting? And as far as I know, it doesn't exist in the algebra literature, although if anybody knows of a version of this, it would be interesting to me. Um, so I thought what I would do in this talk is firstly give you a quick overview of what the graded story looks like, and then take you through some of the the, the main steps that I've been working on to sort of generalize this to a non-graded theory. Um, now, you know, not being a professional algebraist, I had a lot of fun learning about various bits of ring and module theory, particularly in Lamb's book on rings and modules. Um, all sorts of things I didn't know before, which I learned on the way. So I, I very much enjoyed uh, doing this project, partly because I learned so much new mathematics. Um, okay, so Here's what the graded story looks like. Um, everything's over a field. Um, topologists are primarily interested in this in the case of a characteristic P field. And the main examples in the original development of this are to do with the Steenrod algebra at a prime. But I mean, this works completely generally. You have a field. Um, you have a graded connected algebra. I'm using upper indexing, cohomology indexing, it's a P-algebra if it's a union of Poincaré duality subalgebras. Now, I should say, for those who aren't aware of graded things like this, Poincaré duality algebra is the graded version of Frobenius algebra. Um, in the Moore and Peterson paper, they, they tended to refer to these things as Frobenius algebras, but strictly speaking, when you put a grading in, it should be a Poincaré duality algebra or Poincaré algebra. So th this, this thing is a union of these Poincaré duality algebras, and it's a strictly increasing union. <clears throat> and you need a condition that um, the, nth one, the n plus first one is flat as a left or right module over the nth one. Um, and then Okay, once you've got that, you, um, you look at what's really going on here. Um, the, okay, in the Moore and Peterson paper, they didn't really insist on A0 being K, they just insisted on it being a Frobenius algebra. But in the Margolis version, he's really thinking of the case where A0 is the ground field, so it's a kind of connected story. But I mean, you can generalize it to a more a broader setting there. Um, okay, what does Poincaré duality really mean? It means in this graded setting that you've got a top non-zero dimension and then a kind of non-degenerate pairing involving um, a choice of uh, uh, generator in the top to um, 
uh, sort of pared down in a non-singular way, <clears throat> just as with Frobenius arguments you do. Okay, so um, now one of the conditions here is this flatness condition. Now, if we insist that the ANs are hot algebras and each AN is a sub hot algebra of AN plus one, that comes for free because um, sub hot algebras of finite dimensional hot algebras are free. Um, that's true in both the ungraded and the graded setting. So you get that flatness in the world of hot algebras without any extra assumptions. Mm. Um, because I've insisted that these the sequence is strictly increasing, of course, A is not going to be bounded above, and um, it also doesn't have to have finite type, although in practice, if you want to do things like passing to the dual co-algebra setting, you really need to put finite type conditions. And in practice, all the interesting examples are finite type anyway. Um, so, okay, so what can you prove once you've got all of this? Well, if you have a P algebra, um, as a module over at one of the ANs, it's free and injective as a left or right module. Second property, it's not an Ethereum, but it is coherent, right? So what is a coherent ring? It's a ring where, every finitely generated left or right ideal is finitely presented. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a weaker condition than Ethereum, but it's still a very strong condition if you want to do certain types of homological algebra. Um, third condition, as a module over itself, it's, self, it's injected, it's self-injected. More generally, bounded below free modules are injected. And then you get this whole slew of equivalent conditions on bounded below modules, free, projective, flat, injective, and free over the ANs. Those are all equivalent conditions. And then for those who like thinking about homological algebra, um, if these conditions aren't satisfied, then you have infinite uh, projective, injective, and flat dimensions. So, you know, these are sort of conditions that a, a ring and module theorist would be interested in. Now, if you think of the case of a Frobenius algebra, you basically get all of this as well. So this is a generalization of very standard facts about Frobenius algebras. <clears throat> okay, um, I've mentioned coherence. Um, if you're working with a coherent ring, then finitely generated modules turn out to be finitely presented, and those are usually just called coherent modules. Um, in fact, the the category of coherent modules is an abelian category, and it has, well, it only has finite limits and co-limits. You don't have arbitrary limits and co-limits, but um, it may not be so obvious if you've not seen this before that it's an abelian category. You have to check that things like homomorphisms have coherent co uh, kernels and co-kernels and so on, but that's all standard and not true. Though some of it's a little bit trickier to check than others. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, so what else? Um, here's something else that's a little bit surprising. If you have a P algebra and a coherent module, it turns out it embeds in a finitely generated free module. Now, again, if you know about Frobenius algebras, this, this is something that is fairly well known, fairly standard, but there's a way of jacking up to this setting. Uh, that has an interesting consequence that a coherent module has an injective resolution by modules which are finitely generated free modules, but they're also injective, right? Now, one reason why I always think this is an interesting result is if you try dualizing to the dual al hot algebra and co-modules over it, except uh, dualizing, of course, means term uh, degree-wise dualizing. So in the world of co-modules over the dual, that actually turns into a statement about there being projective resolutions of co-modules. Now, it's in, generally speaking, when you're working with 
plot algebras and co-modules, the category of co-modules doesn't tend to have projectives in general. It does for things like finite dimensional hot algebras, but you know, it's rather unusual to have projective resolutions of co-modules. And that's what you get when you dualize this in the right kind of way. Um, some other things which turn out to be very useful and have been very heavily used by topologists, um, if you have a finite dimensional A module, so remember we're talking about graded gadgets, so we're talking here about W being a graded thing, but its total dimension is finite over the ground field. And N being any A module. Um, if N is bounded below, then X over A from W to N turns out to be trivial, right? Um, in the special case where N is coherent, Oh, what have I, I've, I've said something silly there. Um, oh, oh, sorry, N is, free. yes, I'm sorry. The first statement is N is free, right? Yeah, sorry, I didn't read it properly. Yeah, so that's where N is free. The second statement is only insisting that N is coherent, then all the X groups vanish. Now these kind of vanishing results occur in topology in, in many papers, um, but they're sort of characteristic of these P algebras. <clears throat> Okay, so that's the graded story. And what I really want to do is go through the sort of main steps of throwing out the gradings and trying to set up a theory of this type uh, more generally, particularly uh, in the case, in the situation where we're looking at a, a, you know, a, a collection of hot algebras um, fitted together. <clears throat> so now in the, the P story, the indexing was on the natural numbers, although it's not that serious. I mean, you can probably jiggle the definitions and take a more general um, indexing system. So what I'm gonna do is index things on a directed system and it's gonna be filtered. Now, what filtering means is if you take two elements, there's an upper bound. Um, I'm also gonna insist that there's a lower bound, a, a, a lambda zero, which is kind of a least element, um, and that, that sort of is my, my indexing. Um, okay, so what does it mean for an infinite dimensional K algebra to be locally Frobenius of shape lambda? Well, um, you would probably guess what the first bit is that you've got a lambda index system of Frobenius algebras and inclusion homomorphisms. Um, a of lambda zero is going to be the ground field, so that's my sort of base point, um, and A is the union of all of these. I want some sort of flatness condition, so I, I insist that when lambda dashed is less than or equal to lambda double dashed, I get a flat extension. But there's a slightly stronger condition there. Um, now, to be honest, I Two years ago, I thought this condition was really important, but I'm less and less convinced that it plays a major role. But in the Hopf algebra case, um, at least in the local case, this condition is guaranteed anyway. So it's not totally clear whether this condition, this Frobenius extension condition is actually useful or not. So I, maybe I don't need that. Uh, but what, is a, what does it mean to say that you have a Frobenius extension? Well, it's a kind of relative Frobenius algebra. Um, this, this turns out to be a well-known condition. Um, and I'll say a bit more about the Hopf algebra case later, but it means, for example, that induction and co-induction from one algebra to another are, are naturally isomorphic functors. So, that's to do with injectives and projectives being the same and so on. <clears throat> okay, so as I say, I, I, I may in the end, when I finally write this up, excise that Frobenius condition, a Frobenius extension condition. Um, okay, so straight away, you can prove some of the results and very, very similar to what was going on in the P algebra story. Um, it's always true that A is left and right coherent, um, and each and A is always a flat left and right module over each A lambda. Um, 
Now, where does that come from? Well, it really comes from a very well-known way of building coherent rings. If you have a, a, an index sequence of uh, coherent rings and take a co-limit, provided going from one of these terms to another is a flat extension, then the, the, the co-limit is, is coherent. So for example, you might start with an, a bunch of Noetherian rings and you can construct a coherent ring. The obvious example of that is if you take an infinitely generated polynomial algebra, take the system of finitely generated subalgebras, um, then the infinitely generated polynomial algebra is coherent, right? That's a good example of that in, in action. It's a very well-known fact, but I mean, it's, it's, it's important here. <clears throat> okay, and now we can go to, um, um, Hopf algebra. So supposing we have a Hopf algebra, which is um, again built up out of um, finite dimensional sub Hopf algebras and the inclusion maps are maps of Hopf algebras, um, then it turns out you get um, a locally Frobenius algebra. Um, so you, you, know, you need to have a bunch of Hopf algebras, finite dimensional fitted together. The, Flatness is automatic here because of what's usually called the, um, the Nicole Swedler theorem, which says if you have a finite Hopf algebra and a sub Hopf algebra, it's the big one is free over the small one. Um, and ah, now the Frobenius extension condition isn't quite automatic. It is if all of these finite things are local rings. But in general, the Frobenius extension condition requires a little bit more than just sub Hopf algebras, it turns out. Um, so even in the Hopf algebra case, you know, I, I need to put that in as a condition. But as I say, in the local case, you get it straight away anyway. So it's, it's there, but maybe you don't need to insist on it. Um, important thing to notice is that if you have a finite dimensional subspace of H, it has to be contained in a H of lambda. Now that's where the filtering condition really comes in because every element in V uh, sits inside some H of lambda, but if you have a basis, it's finite dimensional, so a finite basis, there will be an upper bound for the, the corresponding lambdas, so it sits inside some big enough H of lambda. Um, so this is kind of a local finiteness condition on subspaces and elements and so on. Okay, so, so that's the hot algebra case. And that's really the, the, the situation I want to think about. Okay. Um, let's think a little bit about modules over these things. Uh, as I said before, coherent modules are really the same thing as finitely generated because they're automatically finitely presented. Um, so, as I said earlier, in the graded case, the category of coherent modules is an abelian category. It doesn't have arbitrary limits and co-limits, but it does have finite ones, and it does have enough projectives and injectives. <clears throat> we'll come back to that later. <clears throat> um, I'll come on to that next, yes. Um, okay, so, very similar to the graded story. A is automatically injective, projective, or flat as an A of lambda module for any lambda. Um, ah, now we start seeing something a little bit more sort of hands-on. Um, supposing you have a coherent module. Well, what does that mean? It means it has a finite presentation by free modules. It turns out that you can find a finitely presented, for some suitably big lambda, you can find a finite presentation of some module M dashed over A of lambda, which when you tensor up with A, induces a presentation of M. In fact, uh, the finite presentation you, you might already have. So, Essentially, all the real detail here is going on at the level of some A of lambda. Um, 
Now, this, this is something that topologists, Bob Bruner, use a lot in uh, calculations and writing software and so on, that you know, when you work with coherent modules over, say, the Steenwald algebra, um, this is a really important fact that you can work with finite presentations, not just over A, but over some finite dimensional subject. All right. <clears throat> um, all right. In particular, the module itself is induced. Uh, um, you can sort of build on that and prove that homomorphisms are also induced up from homomorphisms of A of lambda modules for some suitably big lambda. And then you can prove all sorts of spin-offs from that. For example, any coherent module uh, admits an embedding into a finitely generated free module. How do you do that? Well, you work at the level of some A lambda where you're working over a Frobenius algebra where that sort of result is known and then you just induce up. Um, Yeah. Um, okay, and then you can also prove that free these finite generation free modules are injectives in this. Sorry, injectives in this category of coherent modules. Um, I'm not saying they're absolutely injective, but they are for with respect to coherent modules. <clears throat> okay, so that's the sort of games you can play with uh, this. Now, um, Frobenius algebras are what algebra is called cache algebras. That means that if you have a simple module, it has to be isomorphic to a left or right, depending on which sort of modules you're talking about. It's always isomorphic to a left or right ideal in the algebra. Okay, so Frobenius algebras themselves have that property that simple modules are sitting inside the actual algebra. Now, when we come on to these locally Frobenius algebras, that sort of thing isn't quite so easy to get your head around in a sort of general sense. Um, in the case where all of the A alphas are local rings and the homomorphisms are local homomorphisms, that actually means that A is local. Um, and so there's a unique simple module, the trivial module. But on the other hand, it turns out that this is never a sub module of A itself, right? Um, so you get something and you lose something here. But now, of course, if you don't insist on the local condition, um, it's much harder to see, for example, which simple modules might be contained in A, what sort of simple modules there are. There may be some that are infinite dimensional. So, it, it's much harder to see in a general sense what, what's going on with that question. <clears throat> However, um, in, the, in the sort of local setup, what we do know is that um, for a finite dimensional A module, you can prove the result very similar to what we were talking about with the P algebra case, that there are no homomorphisms from a finite dimensional M into A. And of course, that can be deduced from the, the case where M is simple. Um, more generally, if you take a coherent module, X from a finite dimensional module into N is zero. So that is very similar to what we have in the graded case. Um, now, <clears throat> all of this hinges on the case of the simple module, the trivial simple module. And this is one place where you really use the Frobenius pairing inside of these A lambdas. The basic idea is that if M sits inside of A, it's contained in an A lambda, and then you include that in a bigger A lambda, and you exploit the Frobenius pairing to see that you, uh, you, you, get, you, you, you get a contradiction if, the, if it's a submodule. So, um, so you really, uh, the only argument I know for that really does come down to using the Frobenius pairing. Um, okay. The last bit is a, is a nice application of this special kind of injective resolution I mentioned of finite generated free modules, which happen to be injective. Okay. So let me mention a few ring theory results. Um, so let's suppose we've got one of these, these gadgets. Um, what about its, what about radicals? Well, 
Um, the first statement is really, is really about Frobenius algebras. Um, it's to do with the fact that a of beta is injective over A of alpha. And so the, the inclusion map actually splits. And then you can use that to prove that if you intersect the radical of A of beta with A of alpha, that's containing the radical of A of alpha. But this actually goes up to intersecting A of lambda with the radical of A. Um, and that allows you to deduce something about the radical. It's, it's actually the largest nil ideal in, in A. Um, in the case where all the A of lambdas happen to be semi-simple, that implies the radical of A is zero. Of course, because it's not Noetherian, we're not quite getting a semi-simple algebra here. We're getting something called semi-primitive or Lamb calls it Jacobson semi-simple. Um, so if it's not an Ethereum, it's never going to be semi-simple, right? But it has this radical being zero condition, which is sort of sometimes useful for, for that kind of thing. It's always von Neumann regular. Um, another useful fact, if you look at annihilators of elements of A, this is a, really a fact about coherent rings. Um, they, the annihilator ideal of an element is left or right annihilator is always a coherent submolecule, so it's finitely presented. <clears throat> um, and then you can sort of extend that a little bit. If you take a coherent A module and an element, the same thing is true. So these are useful facts if you're playing around with uh, rings and modules and annihilators and so on. <clears throat> okay, so now let's talk a little bit more about this injective, projective, and flat module business. Um, okay, um, so I've already mentioned that finitely generated projectives happen to be injective relative to coherent modules. So, um, so they, so so those are injectives in the category of coherent modules. Um, but we can actually say a lot more about this. Um, so here's a bunch of conditions on a module, on an A module. Um, you can ask for it to be injective for coherent A modules. What does that really mean? Well, you know, it means that if you have the usual kind of injectivity diagram, so a short exact sequence, uh, a short, uh, an exact sequence zero u to v and a map from u out to your module. Um, if you're talking about coherent modules u and v, uh, if that then um, m will be, will always split that, um, that sort of sequence, but only for a diagram with coherent modules. <clears throat> flat, well, everybody knows what flat is, projective, and fourth condition, a product of flat modules. Now, I should say that um, coherent rings have a very nice property. In fact, coherence itself for a ring is characterized by the requirement that products of flat modules are flat. That's a, a well-known, I think that's called Chase's theorem. Um, so that's why I've put that in. <clears throat> so how are these related? Well, some of them are equivalent, D, implies B, that's because of this coherence property, this Chase theorem. Um, and so you get um, some equivalences and an implication. <clears throat> okay, now that again should remind you of the graded story, but um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the ungraded world. <clears throat> now, how do you prove that? Well, this is one of the things I sort of quite enjoyed learning about that there are different ways of characterizing flatness. For example, um, one way to characterize flatness is that a module is flat if and only if every homomorphism from a finitely presented module factors to a finitely generated free module. So um, if you start with a flat module and you take your diagram, your, your exact sequence here of coherent modules, um, and you have a map out to M, first point is that if we assume that M is flat, we can factor 
through a free module. So we get this finitely generated free module, um, but we already know that finitely generated free modules are injective, so at least relative to coherent modules. So we can put in a dotted line there and compose and we get our, our splitting. <clears throat> so, so that's the proof of uh, flat implies relative injective. Um, you can also do it using what some people call the Lazard theorem or the Lazard Gobroff theorem, which says flat modules are uh, filtered co limits of finitely generated free modules. So uh, that's a more direct proof, but it uses a heavier handle, so a heavier hammer. <clears throat> okay. Uh, going the other way is also interesting. Um, so if you have um, a relative injective, and a coherent module N and a map from N to M, we want to factor it through a finitely generated uh, free module. So what do we know? We know that coherent modules embed in finitely generated free modules. And ah, now we've got this relative injective condition, so we can split. Um, and that's, the, that's checking that it satisfies the condition for flatness. <clears throat> um, so, um, yeah, so that's sort of playing around with some characterizations of flat modules that I certainly didn't know before. <clears throat> There's also this connection with Chase's theorem here, which is consistent with the fact that products of injectives are injective, and that's true for relative injectives. Okay, so, all right. I haven't really mentioned any concrete examples, so maybe I should give you a list of very general classes of examples. Um, one which actually Kenny Brown mentioned to me a couple of years ago, which I didn't haven't thought of before. Um, there's a notion of a locally finite group. So this is a group where any finite subset is contained in a finite subgroup. And you can look at its group algebra. And if you think about it a bit, you'll see that that is a locally Frobenius Hopf algebra because the finite group algebras sit inside of each other. They are sub Hopf algebras. You get this freeness condition, so all the conditions are satisfied there. <clears throat> but of course, this sort of illustrates where things can get really complicated because these finite dimensional algebras will contain eigenpotents in general. So you would expect to get lots of um, lots of uh, simple ideals and so on inside. So on the other hand, if you take the case of a union of finite p groups and the field to be characteristic P, then it's going to be a local ring. So then you're back in the, the local situation um, that I, I talked about earlier. <clears throat> Going in the other direction, you could start with a sort of pro system of, um, well, you can do this in general for an inverse system of finite dimensional Hopf algebras. In particular, you might take a a profinite group and take its group algebra in a pro sense. If, if you've not met this before, you take, oh, I've left off a field. There should be a K in there. And you take the inverse limit of the group algebras of finite quotient groups. And this is called the pro group ring or profinite group ring. Um, and if you take a suitable notion of dual, it's what's called the finite dual, or some people call it the restricted dual. That will be an example of a locally Frobenius hot algebra. Um, this profinite group ring is sort of the opposite. It's kind of a completed gadget, whereas the, the finite dual is a kind of co-limit construction. This is a limit construction here. Okay. <clears throat> so that's sort of two very big classes of examples. Um, if you want to work with both commutative and co-commutative hot algebras, one really obvious source, if you know about this kind of um, hot algebra theory, uh, is associated to what are called p-divisible groups or group schemes. Um, now, I, I don't want to sort of spell out what all of this is, but um, basically it's what you get when you take something like the uh, the, the group scheme of torsion points in an elliptic curve over a field of characteristic P, you take the, 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 the 
the, the group scheme associated with things of order of power of p, except that you don't really get, in characteristic p, you don't get points, you, you get sort of formal points, so you have to pass the formal group. Um, so this is another place where you can actually find examples of this kind of setup. And this even has an additional kind of structure. It's really to do with the Frobenius powering operation. So these are kind of Frobenius in two senses, right? Just as I've been talking about things which are local in two senses, this is sort of doubly Frobenius. Um, now, I haven't really explored that very much, and I'm not sure what it really adds to the known story about this, but it does provide examples of these kinds of constructions. And then another kind of example that, um, well, th this one is, is well known to certain topologists, certainly Jack Marava knows about this, um, but it also crops up in lots of places in algebra. This is the, what topologists call the Lambeva Novikov algebra. And one place you find this is if you look at um, power series over some field, which begin with the variable, so x plus higher terms, and then you think about them under composition. Now, if you think about the group scheme you get associated to the specifying the coefficients, you get a polynomial algebra uh, on infinitely many generators, and the, the co-product is exactly to do with the formula for composition of power series. So I won't spell out very explicitly, well, it's sort of here in some sense, but you have to interpret the right-hand side. You have to take some huge power series and pick off a certain term in it. Um, and um, <clears throat> that, that gives you a hot part of it. It's not co-commutative, but it is commutative. And the dual object turns out to be um, a locally Frobenius hot part of it. Now you have to interpret dual a little bit carefully. I'm not sure it is actually the finite dual. It's th the right way to define it is to put a grading and take the sort of graded dual. But if you then forget the grading, you get you get a, a locally Frobenius hot part of it. Um, but as I say, I'm not actually sure if that is exactly the same thing as the as the finite dual or not. Um, now this is really interesting in positive characteristic. And just to give you a taste for those who know about Hopf algebras, the primitives in this Hopf algebra in positive characteristic, uh, there are sort of two infinite families, the iterated piece powers of the first generator and the iterated piece powers of the second generator minus square of the first. Um, and of course, if you dualize, then that tells you what the generators of the dual algebra are. These are going to be the sort of dual elements to these. Okay. Um, now it's a little bit tricky to prove that's locally Frobenius. Um, it, it involves a little bit of work, and I, I think I have an argument, but I've never written it out. So, um, okay. Um, again, this I, I keep saying that this is well known to topologists. Well, one of the reasons it's well known is that. It contains, if you think of it as a group scheme, it contains the, the formal automorphisms of the line, which are additive. And in characteristic P, those are things which only involve x, x to the p, x to the p squared, and so on, right? If you want them to be additive. And the corresponding Hopf algebra is basically the polynomial part of the dual scheme of algebra. Right, so this has some connection with the Steenwood algebra, uh, but it's a slightly bigger gadget to look at. <clears throat> okay, so, all right. <clears throat> well, at the beginning, I think I said that I wasn't originally sure what I was gonna talk about, but um, there is a connection between the story that I've been telling you and what goes on in the world of triangulated categories, because an interesting thing to try to figure out is what is the correct stable module category to work with, or rather, what are the interesting stable module categories to work with here? If you're working with a Frobenius algebra, there are essentially two obvious stable module categories. One is where you allow all modules and you 
throw away the homomorphisms which factor through projective modules or equivalently injective modules. The other thing you can do is restrict to finite dimensional modules or equivalently finitely generated modules. Um, if you're working with a Frobenius algebra, these give you symmetric, mod well, at least if your Frobenius algebra is a co-commutative Hopf algebra, this gives you a stable module category which has a symmetric monoidal structure. So there's even a sort of tensoring structure there <clears throat> and it's symmetric. Now, what happens if we work with locally Frobenius algebras? Well, you have a lot of choices here. You could just decide to work with finite dimensional modules. And again, in the world of co-commutative Hopf algebras, you get a nice symmetric monoidal structure. The slightly unpleasant side of that is that your, when you define which homomorphisms you want to ignore, the sort of homotopy relation, you factor through projective or injective modules, but those aren't finite dimensional. So you're sort of factoring outside of the category of finite modules. So that doesn't seem terribly uh, self-contained. Um, Another thing you might do is take coherent modules. And those, you know, those from many points of view seem like a good thing to work with because that category does have projective and uh, sort of relative injective objects. Um, so you could define the stable module category for that, but then you run into a problem if you want a monoidal structure because if you try tensoring coherent modules together, you don't get coherent modules. Now, tensoring means tensoring over the ground field and then taking the sort of diagonal, uh, uh, diagonal module structure. Remember, we're working with a hot point. So, you know, that category based on coherent modules does not have an obvious monoidal structure. Um, as far as I know, there's no way to sort of patch, no obvious way to patch that. Maybe there is. Um, right. <clears throat> so, let me sort of tell you some, some of my thought processes that I went through trying to sort of come up with something here. So let me just remind you of some basic definitions uh, which work for any ring. Um, so firstly, we have the idea of a finitely generated module. This is something with a surge action from a finitely generated free module or equivalently finitely generated projective. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> There's another condition which in Lamb's book is called finitely related. I think some people unfortunately use this to mean also finitely generated, which I'm not insisting on. So what does finitely related mean? It means you have a short exact sequence with a free module and a finitely generated kernel. And then there's another condition which isn't actually given, in fact, it's not mentioned in Lamb's book, which is very obvious, slight variation. You replace the free module in the middle by a projective module and insist on finitely generated uh, kernel. Okay, so those are those are sort of you know conditions that come up all over the place. So first of all, what does what does it mean for a module to be both finitely generated and finitely related? Well, that's equivalent to finitely presented. Now, the proof of that involves Shanwell's lemma. So it's one of these nice little arguments that you fit together properties of two different resolutions to get a statement about something being finitely generated, exactly what Shanwell's lemma was designed to do. <clears throat> the one that's most interesting is what does this finitely related condition really mean? Well, it turns out that's equivalent to being a sum of a finitely presented module and a free module. R can be any ring here, right? They're not talking about coherent rings, um, any old ring. <clears throat> and finitely related, again, using a nice criterion for flatness, it turns out that you can prove finitely related is equivalent. Uh, for a finitely related module, flat and projective are equivalent conditions. <clears throat> and then for this projectively finitely related condition that I mentioned, um, it turns out that's equivalent to being what you might call stably finitely presented. It's, it's basically uh, 
trying to be finitely presented, but you have to add on some free sum arms on both sides. Now the proof of course involves some version of the Allenberg swindle argument. Um, so this is the only time in my life where I've ever actually used that, I think. Um, so, so this projectively finitely related condition is, you know, say up to adding on free sum arms, uh, it looks like a finitely presented model. So let's sort of see what, what am I thinking about this? Well, it sort of suggests to me that maybe the right way to build a stable module category is to go to something like these projectively finitely related modules, which includes the coherent modules, but you're allowed to add on huge free summons um, and think about the stable module category based on that. Now, I, I, I'm not entirely sure whether, whether that kind of stable module category is used in, in other settings. I mean, maybe those who know about this kind of thing can tell me if, if this is true or not. Um, okay, so that's, so that's my sort of vague feeling that that should perhaps give the, a, a, a good version of a stable module category. Okay, but it still suffers from this problem. There's no obvious monoidal structure. And as far as I can see, it's still a problem because even if you tensor coherent modules, you don't get uh, projective, fin projectively finitely related um, results. So, you know, it, it's not obvious to me that that solves that problem. Okay, so what are we doing for time? I mean, I could stop here. I could say something about trying to dualize to co-modules over a dual. Is it okay if I have another five minutes? Yeah. yeah, okay. All right, so now this, in a sense, the, part of my motivation for this is that in the topological setting, I, I've been doing a lot of calculations, um, homological calculations with co-modules and a lot of these ideas, even in the graded setting that I've been thinking about, are to do with getting vanishing results for certain types of co-modules or X groups. So it's the, it's the sort of dual story that's really been prodding me to, to think about these things all the way along. So um, let's think a little bit about what happens if you try to dualize from a locally Frobenius hot algebra. Well, the first problem is that Dualizing in just the naive sense is probably a bad idea because you don't get um, you don't get a co-algebra if you do that. What you can do is take this finite dual gadget. And what is that? Well, it's the linear maps from H to the ground field which vanish on some ideal of finite co-dimension. <clears throat> and it turns out it's, this is a standard construction. I think it's sometimes called the Swedler dual. This is always a hop algebra. Um, it's co-modules because a co-module over H0 has an action of H. There's a standard way to get a module structure of H on it. The, the, the co-modules turn out to support the structure of a locally finite dimensional H module, right? So, you know, the, the co-modules you get naturally are modules, but of a very restricted type. <clears throat> However, the problem from the point of view of these locally Frobenius things is when you dualize, even if your H is huge, you can still get something very small for the restricted dual. You can even just get the ground field. So in particular, this is to do with the fact that H doesn't have to be residually finite, um, which is a, a condition that a lot of people think about. Um, so this is not good in the sense that, um, you know, this H up a zero can be a quite a tiny object. So you're not going to see a lot of the interesting um, co-modules that you might expect, which dualize to big modules. Okay. Mm. Um, on the other hand, um, if you start with a finite dimensional H module, uh, it has a natural H0 co-module structure and its linear dual does as well. And these are equi essentially equivalent bits of structure. <clears throat> but 
trying to dualize between H modules and H0 co-modules, you, you know, you, you do run into some issues here. So for example, duality, so an H0 co-module does have a, an H module structure, but you could also try taking the linear dual of an H0 co-module and putting a sort of dual H module structure on it. But there, that dualizing, you probably also want to take a restricted dual, a finite dual. So there are a number of different games you can play. Now, in the graded world, if everything in sight is finite type, that kind of dualizing works in a relatively straightforward way. But if you don't have finite type conditions, it can be very, very bad. Um, so certainly in the topological setting, I've been working a lot with finite type things. So this has not been such a big problem, but trying to make sense of a sort of generic story here. Um, you know, you can obviously ask questions about, in the local case, um, you know, what sort of, um, sorry, in, in the non-local case, what sort of simple modules do you get and how are they related to simple co-modules over H0 and things like that. Um, uh, so also that you might potentially have some very large simple modules for H. Presumably they're not gonna come, well, they, they're not gonna come from co-modules for H0 in any obvious way. <clears throat> so, um, so final bit of speculation is, and again, this goes back to what I know works quite well in the graded case, if everything is finite and finite type, you do have a notion of what I call coherent co-modules over things like the steamwood algebra or the dual steamwood algebra. Um, and these are things which roughly speaking, they're linear, they're, they're term-wise duals are coherent modules over the steamwood algebra. Now, they have the nice property, they have projective resolutions by uh, projective co-modules. So, you know, that works very well in the graded setting, but I, I just have no idea how to make a story like that work in this general setting with the ungraded story. So, you know, I'm hoping there will be some way of doing this, but I, I don't at the moment know how to get my hands on that. <laughs> Maybe somebody in the audience can suggest something. <laughs> Okay, so I think, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for listening, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Can we all just admit ourselves and give Andrew a round of applause? <coughs> right, so if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and ask what you want to ask, or you can put them in the chat, I guess. Well, if are you aware of this, that there is a notion that's called tate horschild cohomology. And if you have a Frobenius algebra where the pairing is symmetric, this is really closely related to, to Tate cohomology of a group ring. It, it looks like yes, it. That's right. And I was wondering whether your sort of uh, pseudo Frobenius algebras have a nice description and there's a uh, there's work by Buchweiz relating that to the stable category some some version of the stable category so oh, that, right. okay I, yes I'm not I don't know maybe you can email me and send me the yeah details yeah because I, I don't know about that I mean it may very well be that uh, you know this is related to things like that I'm just not aware of it well, the standard examples are always finite dimensional. So this is yeah, definitely yeah. not what, yeah. what this crowd does. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, yeah, Jack, were you asking something? I thought you raised your hand. <laughs> okay. Nice talk. Yeah, do we do we have any more questions for Andrew? Oh. Um, Andrew, can if you can, uh, so I want to ask you something sort of silly. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to that last speculation? Huh. So you're saying there ought to be 
coherent co-modules. Well, okay. I'm not telling you what I mean yeah. by that, really, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm. I, I mean, I, the, the case of the the graded case, I can be absolutely precise what I mean by that. Um, yeah. So roughly, you would expect there to be uh, an in um, sort of co-presentation by finitely generated free modules, which happen to be injected. Right. So, yeah. but it, what, what I'm really sort of thinking about there is, is, a, is that you want to, um, you, you can characterize that in terms of linear duals and coherence over, over H, right? Um, but the trouble is dualizing, you know, linear duality doesn't work very well for these infinite things. So, you have to be a little bit careful about what you actually mean by dualizing. It's, it's both dualizing in the sense of switching from H0 co-modules to H modules, but also right. linear dualizing. And so you want to put mm -hmm. both of those ingredients in. Um, so in the graded setting, with term-wise, you know, degree-wise dualizing, then basically you're saying that you've got a co-module, which when you dualize becomes a coherent module where dualizing means linear dualizing right, right. it's like the relationship between homology and cohomology yeah um now that doesn't work so well here because it's not so obvious how to fit linear dualizing into that picture i see yeah yeah thank you um any other questions for andrew Yes, I could ask if something familiar fits into this picture. Um, so if in the classical case with the standard algebra, so, or the dual standard algebra A star, so we have these various quotient of algebras A of N star. And yeah. if, you had, if you had an A star co-module, then it would in particular give a compatible system of A of N star co-actions. Yeah. But you could say, I mean, there are situations showing up where you just get a compatible system of A of N star co-actions, but they don't actually come from a, an algebraic co-action. Yeah, you know, well, that's to do with this inverse limit. You sort of have to uh, work with a topologized tensor product yeah. to, to have a co-action to that, that sort of a topologized tensor product. Is, is, is this I, related I, to what you're thinking about towards the end here? Or, or it's is it sort of related? I mean, if, if you go back to, um, sorry, I, I have to be careful how I flip this up. Um, sorry, I'm not very good at moving around on the screen. Um, how do I do this? Right. Uh, yeah, I want to go back up a couple of slides to the examples. Um, where are the examples? Sorry, it's further up than this. Uh, much further. Uh, right. Um, yeah, you, you see, if, if you have an in a pro system of finite dimensional hot dogs, the, the inverse limit should be some sort of completed hot dog. But if you dualize and take a co-limit, you will get something. I think that is the finite dual of um, the completed thing. But of course, you might have inside of the completed thing a dense subhot algebra, and that might be a better thing to work with. Right? That's sort of related to what you're saying, I think, John. But. Um, But you know that avoids you explicitly talking about the completed tense of it, but it's sort of there in the background. I think. <clears throat> yeah, we're talking about topologies. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, Related to that is, is a question. I, I know that when you work with co-modules, if you want to define the product in the category of co-modules over some fixed co-algebra, it's not quite the usual product of vector spaces. It's, it's a sub-gadget. And I'm not quite sure what, is, is it true that the limit of a system of co-algebras is the sort of, or let's think about the product. Is the product of a bunch of co-algebras in the categorical sense the vector space product? 
or is it a sub gadget you got? Well, I think it's the sub. It's, there's usually sort of a maximum algebraic sub gadget, the sort of the, the subset of points where the co where the completed coaction happens to be actually a finite. Yeah. Right. Sub. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, right. So I mean, this, so, so this shows up a lot with you know with the single construction and such. Yeah. So so when you take when you take a limit, you may not get the limit of the of the vector spaces. Right, then you sort of have a choice whether you want to, yeah. I mean, if, you, if you want to do it within co-algebras, then, then it's a, you typically get a smaller thing. Whereas if you're yeah, willing to yeah. work with completed co-algebras, then you might, yeah. might get a bigger thing. And yeah, yeah. the Siegel conjecture is, is sort of about comparing those two. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, that's, I, I think I sort of said at some point, you know, you might take a dense subalgebra and dualize, you take the finite dual, that, that might be what, just as good as taking the limit, whatever the limit means. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, thank you, John. Um, do we have any more questions for the speaker? Well, if not, uh, let's thank Andrew again for this wonderful talk and for thank agreeing you. to speak at such short notice. Yeah. And. Uh, can I just can I just apologize for giving out the time wrong twice uh, in the U.S. <laughs> time zones? I know I know a few people got uh, confused by that. Yeah, uh, there will be another talk soon. I'll send out the details when I have to. Thank you all for coming. Stop recording. Oh. <laughs>